Cool. All right, so to recap our discussion, there's gonna be no midterm review. The midterm will have questions on it. You'll be expected to answer those questions. Uh, hopefully you can infer from the material. I like that you can find vulnerabilities, so you should expect to be able to read code and talk about find vulnerabilities, know the different kinds of vulnerabilities, what, they're, what the capabilities they allowed, why they're vulnerable, all that kind of stuff, right? Those are the important things. Everything we've covered up until after today is fair game. Any other questions? Cool. All right. I should have done first. Oh, hey. Look at that. Fancy. Let me. Yeah. It's a weird button that only sometimes works. Okay, so. Uh, I'm actually going to skip a lot of content, so there's about, uh, we're going to go over loop overflows, which are really important, and then we're going to go over format strings, and then we're going to look at defenses against these binary exploitations that we talked about. So for those of you who are, uh, you know, doing the levels, there may be some of the levels have to relate to some of the things I'm skipping, but only definitely after 10. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Um, so don't worry, you know, if you want to stop at 10, stop there. The slides are still available. They're still in the slides. They're just hidden. So you can easily see that content and you can go look and learn and all that fun stuff. So questions on, all right, let's get into it. Okay. So we saw on Wednesday, right, we saw loop overflow vulnerability. So we saw, or, sorry, we saw index overflow, right, where you can control the index so you can overwrite any relative address from an array, right? So in loop overflows, so I do, do I mean that we're overflowing a, a loop and a for loop or a while loop, the code of the loop? It's the thing with the index used in the loop. Right, so yeah, so not, it doesn't have anything, you're not overwriting the loop, right? But we're <coughs> controlling the loop iteration, right? How many times does that loop iterate? And so if we can do that, uh, we can often have a security vulnerability. Um, and a very special case of this that happens often uh, is, no, it didn't stop. Can't stop, won't stop. All right, but my clicker won't work. Unplugging it and plugging it. This is actually hilarious. Oh, I don't want to go. I didn't do it again. Okay, wow, that's crazy. Um, okay, so anybody ever write uh, off by one error? What does off by one error mean? So there's the famous, well, there's actually lots of variations of this joke. I to remember one variation, right? So there's only two difficult problems in computer science, right? Naming things, cache invalidation, and off by one errors, right? So, wow, that was, got a terrible response. <laughs> You're not having a midterm today, so you can relax a little bit and laugh, right? Okay, so what's an off by one error in a loop? What does that mean? Yeah, so we're, we're looping through something over the length of something, and we should be doing less than length, right? But if we do less than or equal to the length, that allows us to go one extra, right? So we're looping, our loop iterator is going one more than we expect. Um, so it's similar to array overflows, right? In the sense that uh, we're going past the bounds of the array. But the key thing is that oftentimes we're only one, we can only go one element above that array, right? And so these are very tricky because oftentimes the program will not crash when you do this, right? It, um, and you, you may have to wrangle the computer to make sure that you can actually do what you want it to do. Um, so what's, so if we think about, there's a buffer on the stack, right? It's, I don't know, it doesn't matter the size, 
What's, it's the only variable on the stack. What's right above that buffer of the local variables? The save base pointer, right? Yeah, so an off by one error, right, will allow us to go to the array and go one above that, that saved, one above this loop, right? Um, so we can maybe modify either, depending on the size of the data, we can modify either the least significant byte, which is usually the case because we're talking about character buffers, or the whole thing. So uh, there's a really good paper, if you want to get more in depth into this, uh, frame pointer overwrite. I highly suggest reading this paper. So let's look at an example to see exactly what happens. So here we have some function. It's got a 256 byte character array. It's got an integer i. It has a for loop. So this for loop is going from 0 to 256. It's setting the ith element of the sm array that gets passed in, copying that to buffer i, and then squitting. So what essentially is this, I mean, actually I guess this is better. It's essentially a mem copy, right? So we're moving memory 250 six bytes, uh, well, actually, we want it to be 256 bytes, right, from SM to buffer, right? That's what the developer wanted to do. So if we look at main, we say, hey, you know, you got to make sure you pass us two arguments, and then we call this function with argv1, and then we return, right? So is it super clear by looking at this that there's a vulnerability in this code, and that you could exploit it? <laughs> you can get a huge thing on the top that says off by one overflow colon example. <laughs> yeah, this colon there is a vulnerability in this program. Yes. Right? So where is it? So where is the vulnerability? Right. Yeah, the less than or equal to, right? In that in that loop iterator. So how many times is this loop going to execute? Two hundred and fifty-seven times, right? which is what makes this really, really tricky to look at and just eyeball and see, yeah, there's definitely a vulnerability, right? Because oh, the difference between less than and less than or equal is very slight. Plus there's not, the number 257 doesn't appear anywhere, right? We have to know that based on the semantics of the looping and our experience with for loops and our experience of knowing that I'm showing you an example that's specifically about this type of vulnerability, right? So, the question is, can we exploit this example? If so, how? So let's think, let's look at the, the function func. It's kind of funky, I think you have to return type, but it's gonna be void. Uh, what's the layout that that stack could be like now? Just the number so that it comes back into the string that we supply. Then what would that mean? Not back into the string, back into the buffer. Mm -hmm. So we could from there print it forward. Yeah, so what does the base pointer actually do? So is it like EIP? Once we control the base pointer, we definitely get it to execute our code? So let's think about the stack. What's the stack going to look like here at this point? So at this point where it's going to do this copy, what's the stack look like? So let's assume that the variables are in this order as they appear. So first there's buffer, and then under so underneath the first variable on the stack, right, local parameters is going to be i, and then above that is 256 bytes, so 256 characters. So then what's above that? The saved base pointer, and then what's above that? Above the saved base pointer? Instruction pointer, yeah, the saved instruction pointer, and then what's above that? SM, yeah, exactly, the argument SM. Right, and then above that is mains, locals, and mains, all that main stuff, right? So if we go buffer plus 257, are we gonna get to 
We'll get to the base pointer. Are, can we overwrite that whole thing? Why not? The size of the character, right? Exactly. So characters only one, uh, eight bits wide, right? One byte. So by this final write where it's going to be buffer bracket 256 is going to go buffer plus 256 and overwrite that byte and change that byte, which is going to be the least significant byte of the saved EVP. So we can't change the instruction pointer. Right? We, we, can, we cannot, we're not going to get there. Right? We're not overriding the instruction pointer. We're only overriding the base pointer. Right? But does that get us execution right away? Good answer, I like that. I concur. Okay, let's look. So this really has to do with the function epilog. So what's the normal function epilog on x86? Leave and then ret. So what does leave do? Yeah, so it actually does two things, right? So it first, so we gotta remember our base pointers somewhere for our current function. Right, so we know based on what we just saw, there's going to be i, and then there's going to be the buffer, and then the save the base pointer is going to be there, right at where the save base pointer is, and above that's going to be eip. So the stack pointer is going to be somewhere down farther, right, because we allocated memory when we called this function. Right, so what leave has to do, it first has to essentially deallocate by moving the stack. So it first does a move the base pointer into the stack pointer. So make the base make the stack pointer point to wherever the base pointer is. Then it does pop EVP. So then it does restores the base pointer that's saved on the stack. So in these examples, I'm going to explicitly write out these two instructions. So these two instructions move EVP into ESP, right? But that's moving the stack pointer up to where the base pointer is. And then pop EVP pops that value into EVP. So those two are exactly equivalent to the leave instruction. But I'm writing it out here so we can see exactly what happens. And then what does ret do? Yeah, pop EIP essentially, right? Or start, uh, so get that value on the stack and start jumping to it and also move the stack up one. Okay. The ret, it's the, it should be the EIP that would save when you call the call function, or the call instruction, right? Because the call instruction pushes a, uh, pushes the next instruction that would have been executed onto the stack. That's where the save EIP comes from. And it's right above the previous EVP that yes. pops, right? Yes, exactly. So this pop EDP, right, puts stored EDP in EDP, and then that pop moves the stack up. So ret, so now what the stack is pointing to is the saved instruction pointer, and then ret jumps to that and moves the stack up. Cool. Okay, so let's look at this. So we have stack pointer, the, so these are our registers, right? The stack pointer, the base pointer, and the program counter, or the instruction pointer, right? And so we're kind of doing this a little bit more symbolically, uh, so hopefully it should be a little easier to understand. So. The program counter is now at this instruction, right? So we haven't actually executed this instruction yet. So, question you should, some of the things you should be able to do, right? Look at this function and write the stack that the function should have at this point, right? So we saw that there'll be an integer i, and then there'll be buffer, right? So these uh, here, even though these are look kind of wide, well, these are actually each one byte, so this is not going to be the whole um, uh, objects are not drawn to scale, right? Exactly, there would be four on one line, right? But it's a little harder to see that. And then above that buffer, right? So the end of the buffer is buffer bracket 255, right? That's how to get to the final byte of the buffer. And then right above that is going to be the saved 
EVP. And then above that's going to be saved EIP. And actually, if we go up, we can see that main doesn't didn't have any local variables. So right above that is going to be, uh, actually, this is wrong. There'll be saved EVP of main's caller and saved EIP of main's caller and then the argument. But, um, ah, also, yeah, the parameter SM is also missing. Oh, what are you going to do? You live and learn. <laughs> Yes, close enough for me. Okay, so we know, so base pointer, right? So we know that the base pointer is going to point here, right? Because we reference all local variables by negative offsets from the base pointer, which is going to go down, and we reference parameters by positive. So it's going to go up to reference the positive arguments. And so from looking at this, we can tell that, okay, this is main's function frame. And this is, uh, sorry, this is function funks, I gotta use a different name. This is funks function frame, right? And above that is main, and we also know that the stack points to here. It really doesn't matter exactly where the stack is, but we know that the stack is gonna be below EVP, right? So, what's gonna happen, how is this diagram gonna change based on executing this instruction? So stack pointer is going to change where? where is it? Same DVP, right? They're going to both point to the same place. Right? And now, essentially all of this has been freed in some sense, right? So it's grayed out because it's freed from the program's perspective, right? But those memory addresses are still there. We didn't change what's in those addresses, right? Oh, did I go too far? Okay. So then what happens in the next instruction? Off of this? Well, we haven't done the copy. We're at the end of the function right here. We, just normal stepping through this to understand exactly what happens here in the epilogue. So then what happens here? What happens with this pop BBB? Yeah, so EBP is then going to point up, right? It's going to point somewhere up here to main's base pointer. Whatever that value that was in save EBP is now going to be where our base pointer points to. Cool. What happens to the stack pointer? Does it remain the same? Why? Somebody argue one way or the other. Easy to mumble and answer. Yeah. Wait just a second. Eric. Oh, I thought you were small, raising your hand. I was saying, you know, like small, so it's going to pop, so that means there's no data. Yeah, you're, it's going to pop, right? That's <laughs> it pushes and pops change EI, uh, change the stack pointer, right? So at the end of this, the stack pointer is going to move up one, so it's going to point to the save EIP, right? Which makes sense because we've just gotten rid of the save base pointer. We saved this base pointer so that we could use it in func, or we could, that func could use its own base pointer. And then when we're done, we want to go back to main, so we want to get rid of that memory. So now that we're in here, EBP is going to point somewhere up here. It's not exactly there. And then stack pointer is going to point to the instruction pointer. Right. And then so now what's going to happen when we call ret when we return? Yeah, pop EIP, right? So it's going to take this saved instruction pointer value, start executing there, and then it's going to move the stack pointer up one. Right. So it's going to go to main, right? Where main's doing something. And then it's going to call uh, return zero. So the stack pointer is above the save DIP, and the base pointer is somewhere above that. And so from our function, we know we call this func, and then we return immediately, right? OK. Yes? Instruction pointer is going to point up one. In this case, it's at RV, but it's not actually RV. Right? So the stack pointer is going to move up when we call ret. Right? Because we pop that save DIP into DIP. So we pop so we move the stack. Cool. Okay, so now 
So in this diagram, what can we change with this off by one overflow? Saved EVP. So what, can we control the whole thing? Just one byte, exactly. So when our program accesses buffer 256, it's actually referencing this byte on EDP, right? And so depending on the end in this, right? So on x86, this is going to be the least significant byte. So we can control the least significant byte of EBP. Okay, so let's think about what that gets us, right? Because if we go back here, well, if we control the base pointer, then what? Let's say you can point this base pointer to anything, right? Does that change anything here? Right? So we control the saved base pointer. So now at this, when we do pop EBP, now EBP can point anywhere. But does that get you anything here? Hmm? Let's look at that. Yeah. But right here, right, with function in functions epilogue, normally, on a normal buffer overflow, right, you have at this return instruction, you control the save VIP so you can make it go wherever you want, right? And this ret instruction transfers control from the program to your shellcode, right? That's what you want. But if you've just changed this base pointer, ret still happens exactly how it would happen, right? And you're gonna go back to main and start executing main. Okay, so our goal is we wanna see what we can do by changing this doesn't have to be the last byte, but just changing EVP, what can we do? So let's try to track it. Okay, so from the epilogue, right? So we're moving the base pointer into the stack pointer, right? So, right? So this is any epilogue, function epilogue, moves the base pointer into the stack pointer. So this now changes the stack pointer right before it's going to do what? Pop EVP and then what? Return, right? How does it know where to return to? What register does return implicitly use? How does it know what this, where the saved instruction pointer is? The stack pointer, yes, because where the stack pointer is pointing to at a return, that's where it's going to go jump to. What are we controlling in this instruction? What happens here? Where does what happens to the stack pointer? It goes to wherever the base pointer is pointing to, right? So now, what if we control this base pointer? Now we control the stack pointer, and now when we do pop EVP. Something of our choosing is going to be popped into EVP, right? So now the, the stack pointer is where EVP was, our frame pointer, plus four bytes, because we moved up four bytes. Now when we do a ret, now what happens? Yes. So it goes where the stack pointer is, and is going to take that value that that stack pointer is pointing to, put it in EIP, start executing from it, and move the stack up one. So, right, so now the original program counter basically references the original frame pointer, the EBP, right, plus four bytes. Do you see how, so if we control this base pointer, if we can arbitrarily control this base pointer, we can influence what the stack pointer is and then where the program returns from. But we can't do it in the function where the overflow occurs, right? But function is called by main, right? And we can control mains. Essentially, when function is called, when FUNC is called, we can control mains base pointer. Because when function leaves, calls a leave and return, it's going to set up mains base pointer. And then when main does this, right, main has an epilogue, it's going to do this exact same thing. It's going to move the base pointer into the stack pointer. And at this point, now we control the stack pointer because we control the base pointer. And then it'll do pop EBP and then a return. So as long as we make sure that whatever value we put inside EBP, if 
uh, four bytes above that is the address we want to jump to, then the program's going to jump to where we want it to go. And so this is how we can use this. So the idea is in a normal buffer overflow, right, we usually do our NOPs plus our shell code plus the address of the buffer that we want to jump to. Right? So we still want to use NOPs because they're usually always a good idea, right? If you can get away with using it, you want to use some NOPs so that you have a little bit of leeway. Our shell code. Then we're going to do the address of the shell code. And then we want, then we're going to have that lowest byte of the frame pointer, right, of the say EVP. So let's see how we can put this all together, right? So this is the lowest byte of EVP right here. So what we're going to do is we want this buff, we want this save EVP to point here, right, into the shell code. Well, we want to point here so that that way when main returns, it's going to move the stack pointer down here. It's going to do pop, e, pop EBP to pop whatever garbage is here into EBP. And then it's going to do ret to the address of the shell code, which should hopefully go down here. Does that make sense? So you can, so another way to think about it is we essentially want to create a fake function frame for main. Right? So if we consider, oops, if we consider here, right here, if we consider this main's base pointer, let's say we're just, we're given godlike powers and we can just change main's base pointer to point to here right before it returns, right? Then what main's going to do is it's going to move the stack pointer down here first, move EBP into ESP, move the stack pointer down here, pop EBP, so this shell code, whatever it is, is going to be put into EBP, the stack moves up to here, and then it's going to return into the address of the shell code. So our address of our shell code is down here, and it's going to start executing. Yes? So we're, we're attacking the... Oh, sorry. Uh, up here. <laughs> yeah. Ah, so in our original program, can we control the whole base pointer? So let's look at the program. That's a good question. So can we control all of EBP, saved EBP here? <clears throat> Sorry, it's a little small. Right, so because of this, the way this loop is written, right, on the very last iteration, I is going to be equal to 256. And we're going to say buffer bracket 256 is equal to whatever we pass in from SM. But we can't access buffer 250, or no, it's 256. Yeah, we can't access buffer bracket 257, which would be the next byte, or 258 or 259. Yeah, if we could, we could use exactly these same techniques. Just, you know, think about like, if we can do it with one byte, we can do it with all the bytes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. I mean, well, it'd be a little bit, yeah, it's a little bit, this is a mistake that you're, like, very likely to see, right? It's not likely that somebody's going to say less than, um, you know, 258 or whatever, no, plus 4 is uh, 260. Unless they're doing it for the back door. Yeah, unless they're specifically doing it for back, if I was going to do a back door, I'd do it like this, right? Because this is, like, a one character bug here, this equal sign, right? Good question. Yeah, um, is there a Um, I'm trying to think. I think it's defined either by the compiler based on the architecture you're compiling on. I think there's a C header file that defines the size of all the built-ins. Um, because you can, yes, you can run a C program. I mean, you can compile a C program on different architectures that have different sizes of characters, integers, whatever, right? That's the same thing with 64-bit is 64-bit integers um, and other data types. So you definitely can do it. I don't know if you can do it on a 
I don't know how to do it so that it would work on a non system that's like that. Uh, I'm sure you could do it, but the code wouldn't be able to interact, right? You can't run the code that thinks characters are eight bits with code that was written thinking characters are four bits or, or four bytes. Yeah. I don't know. Are there, is there a standard like actual uh, what do you mean a standard? Well, these aren't, I mean, these are characters, but they're, it's more about the size. I mean, we call them chars, but the important thing is that they're one byte. Right, because they need, you need like well, 255 things, then it's only. Ah, but ASCII is only, uh, only seven bits, so you only actually need seven bits for ASCII. And they probably used eight because of byte boundaries, right? Yeah, but this is historical stuff, right? So, you know, they called it a car, but really the only thing that matters is the size of it, right? So you could think of a system that had native UTF-8 or, yeah, UTF, maybe a better example is 16, where every character is 16 bits, so two bytes, so every character would then be two bytes, but then it gets confusing with UTF-8 because characters don't map exactly to bytes, so you want to talk about bytes instead of characters. That's great. You had another question, though. Yeah. Okay, yes. So stay EVP changes in is uh, impact of parenting. So yes, where you make this change, the fact that we're impacting the parent's execution, not the function. Yes, so now we completely control the function frame of main, right? Which also gets tricky if main accesses any of its arguments or local variables, right? It's gonna use our new base pointer, so we better make sure that whatever those offsets are, there's things in there that are not going to break things. That's actually what can make this very tricky, but also very powerful. Yeah, so the problem, the key problem is we're influencing, we're able to arbitrarily change main's base pointer. Well, not arbitrarily in this case, we can only change one byte, but you can think we can arbitrarily control it. Yes? No. Uh, not relatively, that's part of the tricky part. Yeah, so you can't, um, well, okay. You can't control necessarily where your shellcode, where this buffer is on this stack, right? This buffer, the relative offset between this buffer and save DVP is always gonna be fixed, right? Um, where your shellcode is could be a different thing. You could put your shellcode in an environment variable, in which case it's gonna be above. You could put your shellcode in one of the other argv parameters. Um, you could even put it elsewhere on the stack if there were other functions that got called. Um, but you need to get that address of that shell code onto, this, onto some place where you're going to overflow and make the base pointer point to. Yes? Let's see. Wow. I mean, I guess that's true. I mean, how do you do it? You can do it while controlling EIP, right? So, it's say instruction access, pointer? You have access to the full, you can, let's see. You could possibly do it with one byte of EIP, depending, it gets tricky. Full EIP, full EIP, full EIP, yeah, it makes it easier, but this, I'm going to show that, because so off by one is going to be something that is incredibly common. And then we can see how easily this can become, an incredibly simple mistake can become an exploitable vulnerability. If you can control more, your job as an attacker becomes a lot easier than if you didn't have that. Yeah. So, would one of my outcome points give EAP to point to the budget to the system? We want... Yes, we want EIP to point actually four bytes below the address of the shellcode, right? We want save EVP to point here, so that that way when it does a pop EVP, it's going to move up here, and then the ret is going to jump to whatever's above that. Yeah, so could you make this easier for yourself by do nops, shellcode, and then a bunch of addresses of shellcode so that your base pointer only needs to get somewhere in there? Yes, you can definitely do that. 
But we need to first find this uh, address of this buffer, right? We need this address of the buffer, which makes sense, right? Just like when we do a stack overflow, we need the address of our shell code. We need to figure that out so we can jump to that code, right? Um, so you can actually brute force this, just like with NOP sleds. I mean, you can try a bunch of stuff and eventually it'll hopefully get it right. Um, you can also uh, try to find out, use a debugger, try to find out where the stack pointer is and try to find out values. Uh, what do you have to keep in mind when you're doing this with a debugger? Yes, the debugger adds environment variables, so it's going to shift things, right? But you can still, it gives you a pretty good target to hit for, right? And you can kind of adjust. So you can look at the function. You can see uh, the function is here. We can set a breakpoint at this function. And then we can um, run it and then see, in this case, uh, the stack pointer is at bfffc60. Right, so we can actually find the address of our buffer should be, so the stack pointer, right, moved down to make enough room for the variables. So right at the stack pointer is I, right, and then four above that is going to be, should be the address of buffer, right? So we'll use uh, BFFFFC64, right? But now we wanna know what's the address of the address of shellcode? Why do we need to know this? Go back to our diagram. Yeah, we need to know how to change EBP to point here, right? So we, so we need to actually determine what that last four bytes are, right? And we're trying to be precise here, but how many tries is it going to take you to try all possible values for one byte? Two fifty-six. For those that brute force uh, assignment two. How many tries did you have to try? A couple billion? Does 256 seem a lot more feasible? <laughs> Could you even do that by hand if you wanted to? Ooh, nice. Wow. So, but let's talk about how you would try to do this if you're trying to be very precise, right? So we're, uh, we need to determine those last, that address of the shellcode, right? Because we want to determine where we need to change. Let's think about what we already know based on this example. What do we know about EBP from this example? Is it going to be the EBP that we want it to be, the address of the address of shellcode? Do we know anything about it from this diagram? Yeah, so A, it's right below it. So it's going to be what? Greater than, less than? Less than. Less than, greater than. Higher, lower, right? So it's going to be less, it's going to be um, something that's going to be less than us, right? And it's just one of those things you can use to self-check if you're calculating this, right? Okay. So we want to first, so we have the stack pointer, right? We have the address of buffer. Then we want to, we add 256 bytes to get to the very end of the buffer, right? That's pointing at the address of the address of shellcode. But we want to subtract four bytes because we want to move down and get to this point here, right? We want to be four below where the shell address of the shell code is because that's where we want to eventually execute. But we first are always going to do a pop and then a rep. So we can actually just calculate this. We can say, okay, it's probably going to be here. So it's going to be this plus um, 256 up from the stack pointer. Uh, actually, front 250. 260 up, right? Because it's the stack pointer plus this, uh, plus 4, minus 4, plus uh, 256. Right? So the nice thing is, since we do know that we're going to be very close to EBP, right? To that same EBP, right? We know we can actually probably do this with just the one byte. Right? Because we know saved EBP is going to point to somewhere up here, right? somewhere above us on the stack. But no, hopefully it's not. If it's too big, then we maybe can't do it. But in this case, we know it'll probably be very close. right? So we probably know these first three bytes are going to be in the same ballpark. Yeah. The same EBP is for 
Yes, it would point. It would point uh, essentially here. Yeah. It'll be. I guess in this example, there'll be what four up for EIP, then four up for SM, which is what we said, and then that should be where EVP is. So four and four, eight. So it'll be eight bytes up. Yeah. So this depends, obviously, right on the uh, size of main. Right, because main is going to have local variables, so what's the size of the local variables in main? Are they really large? Are they small? Uh, okay, math very jealous. Okay, so now we need to figure out where this is. So we want EVP, right, that save EVP to be the address of the address of the shell code minus four, right, which is going to take us down four. Because the stack is going to be incremented when we do pop EVP, right? So from our example, our calculation is 57, so we can calculate that to be 57, right? Because we want to put the address of the shellcode in there, so we need, so this, so right, so this we just calculated what byte to overwrite. So now we calculated exactly right here what this address is. Remember, but we need to put something in for the address of shellcode that we're going to jump to, right? So we're saying it's going to be you know, 16 bytes down or whatever. Whatever we calculate is going to be within that range, right? So it's, you know, that's knowable, right? Because we're passing in this, all this value here, right? So we know what we think the save VIP is going to be, and then so the address of the shellcode should be just 16 bytes below that. And so in our case, we'll use this example. So now, so what we're going to do, what the code is hopefully going to look like, right? It needs to look like this, where we have NOPs, we have our shell code, our shell code starts, our shell code ends, and then right above that, we have the address of the shell code, right? This is, so in a normal buffer overflow, right? This is what we would try to overflow EIP with. So that EIP would start, the save EIP would start executing into our shell code. Right? But we can't actually do that. But if we can change this saved instruction, uh, saved base pointer, right, so that bfffd5c is here. Now, when main returns, it's going to set the stack pointer here to be bfffd5c. It's going to pop EVP and pop this last four bytes of the shellcode into the base pointer, and then it's going to do ret EIP. Uh, sorry, return, which is going to jump to this code, which is going to jump down here and start executing this. But you are having the assumption that nothing else is residing in this uh, 5C. I'm, the assumption is that exactly at this address, BFFFD5C, or I guess the save EVP change the last byte to 5C, is going to be this specific byte in my buffer. If it's any other byte, this whole thing's not going to work, right? Because we're going to put a different value in base pointer, and then the base pointer of main is going to point somewhere completely different. <laughs> cool. So if we see this, if we go back to our example, now that we've overflowed the save base pointer, right? Now we move base pointer into stack pointer, right? Remember, this is functions epilog. So now this instruction pointer, just like before, is going to point up to here. We're going to pop EVP, which is going to cause the stack pointer to move up one and the base pointer to hopefully point to right here, right? This, this is our goal condition. We want this to happen. But note, right here, we still haven't, you know, this is the important thing, right? We haven't taken control of this function, right? It's still, when it calls return, it's going to jump back into main by using the saved instruct EIP, which we haven't touched at all on the stack. So it's going to do that. It's going to jump back into main. Now, right, function returns. EVP should point to the address of the address of shellcode minus 4. So that when main returns, it's going to set ESP equal to where the base pointer is. It's going to pop EVP, which is going to increase the stack pointer up 1. And then when it does the ret, it's then going to jump into our shellcode. So this is the goal. So now we're in main's epilogue, right? So this is the key. Same steps, different function. So now we move the base pointer to the stack pointer. 
So usually when we do this, right, the stack pointer goes up, right, because it's freeing memory. But since we've corrupted and controlled the base pointer, the stack pointer is actually going to move down, right? The stack pointer is going to point right here, and then we're going to do pop EVP, which is then going to move this shell code into EVP, which means EVP is going to point to garbage. Does that crash our system? Why? Yeah, we haven't dereferenced it, right? We don't care about it. We haven't used it right now. Exactly. Now we do a ret, and then where are we gonna, where's the program counter gonna point to? The address of the shell code, right? Which should be somewhere in here. Well, hopefully a little bit down, right? And then it's gonna start executing our shell code. Pretty cool, right? And maybe it's hard to tell in this diagram, right? But we can see that we've actually, so by doing this, right, when main returns, now essentially, you can see main's frame. Main's frame is no longer up here as far as main is concerned, right? Main's frame is actually here, right? Because we've controlled the base pointer and we've essentially tricked main into thinking that its frame is farther down the stack, right? At an arbitrary place we control. And since the saved, the saved instruction pointer is... Um, is inside the frame, right? The frame defines where the saved instruction pointer is. If we can control where that frame is, we can control where that saved, where the code goes and executes. So more sophisticated attack than standard buffer overflows, right? Uh, we have to be a bit more precise, but um, I think it's really cool. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. We well, it needs to be somewhere in the process's memory. Yes. Make it easier for ourselves? You don't ever need a knock. It's just to make things easier for yourself. Because, um, so you can think that with the knock, that means this address of cell code must be exactly byte precise, right? And the same thing with the way we have it now, right? By overriding this byte, we have got to have in the, the save base pointer point here, otherwise everything fails, right? But, we could actually add a couple of address of shell codes here to then make it so that we only have to get anywhere in here, right? That would be helpful. Um, so yeah, that would be one thing to do, especially in this example, is put your shell code in the environment somewhere, right? Which is where you know what you've been doing with the other, hopefully some other stuff, right? So you kind of know that it's gonna be up here somewhere. Then in the buffer, have the buffer be the address of that shell code everywhere. Right, then this should be very easy and you just need to guess the address of the shellcode. Cool. Okay. So how do we fix this? <laughs> use a different language. What language are you going to use that doesn't have C at the bottom? C++. Ah, C++. Is it, what? C++? It's just the same thing. You could have the same example in C++. Ah, a range-based for loop. Does it work on arrays like like buffers like this? But how does it know the size of this? Uh, for instance, yeah, how does it know the size of SM in this case, right? It's just a pointer. Ah, man, we covered a lot. Yeah, right? So, okay. C++ was not the example I was looking for. I'd say Java, Java, right, would be an example. But still, what's the Java JVM written in? C, right? Doing the same stuff under the hood. Okay, where are we? Yeah. Okay. What else, Eric? You got your hand up? Oh. You can still do it in Java. Is it going to cause a security problem, though? Well, is, are you going to allow you to control the execution? What happens if you access an element that's outside the bounds of the Java? Yeah, you get an exception, right, and the program terminates, right? Where in this case, the program doesn't terminate, it just overwrites memory, right? So you can't overwrite arbitrary memory in a Java program because it's checking the right bounds. Yeah. Um, another way, probably a couple of years ago, we added arbitrary, an arbitrary jump that made it go over 255. That would still be... You mean an arbitrary jump? Like, you add 255 to the local. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, that would be, well, that would give you a little bit, that would help definitely off by one. You could even just add some padding, right, between the local variables and the stack protector, or the state base pointer. That way you're protected from off by ones. Maybe add a bit more so it's off by one, that's depending on the size of your off by one. But yeah, that's kind of only your, yeah, it's exactly, okay. So you gotta thoroughly check loops, right? Uh, another problem is, so if you can control that loop iteration count, right? In this case, it was hard-coded. So it was hard-coded incorrectly, right? But if we control that loop count, we can get it to overwrite more. Um, so, yeah, as we saw, we can do crashes. We can cause the program to, um, we can cause arbitrary code execution, all kinds of bad stuff. All right, so let's stop here. Uh, I will not be here on Monday. Sai, stand up, raise your hand. Sai is going to be proctoring and probably some other people as well since there's a lot of people in this class. So uh, good luck.